What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Chess Giant, your boy Solomon Ardell. Today's video, I'm going to be covering my game uh, in round two of my recent tournament, the 27th Annual Pacific Coast Open held in LA. If you guys watched yesterday's video, you probably saw that I lost to a Fide Master uh, by playing the Hippopotamus Defense as black. I actually reached a pretty good middle game, but ended up uh, f uh, fumbling it strategically uh, a little bit later on. Um, now, you know, I really had about an hour, hour and a half between games. I mean, remember, I mean, these games are 35 minutes a piece with 10 second delay, which is not very long for uh, over the board um, competitive chess, right? So I'm, I'm going, gosh, I'm playing as white the next game. I haven't really played competitive chess for a very long time, consistently at least. I mean, what do I play as white? I'm probably going to play a strong player. I, I did play a strong player. My guy, Albert Zhang, rated 2162. Uh, going up against me with the black pieces and I was going gosh I mean do I do I play the hippo again do I do I play e4 I you know do I go back to my regular e4 which I did for a very long time but you know at that point I'm like gosh there's so many things black can play you know he could be very well versed in the French or the Carl Kahn I could place e yeah I could face e5 and you know um, at that point a ton of different things can happen I go you know what I'm just going to play this move of b3 now guys this actually reached a hippopotamus defense but my original plan was to go, you know what, I'm just going to play b3 and see what black does. If black plays a move here like e5, I'll really get a reverse uh, Owen's defense, right, type game with bishop b2. I know this is technically the Larson's opening or the Nimitz of which uh, Larson attack. But guys, I really uh, enjoy the Owen's defense as, as, as black and as white. I mean, okay, if black plays e5, I have bishop b2. I'll continue with moves like e3, knight f3, d4, put a ton of pressure on that centralized pawn, and we're going to have ourselves a, f a solid game. But my opponent here plays a move of knight f6. I mean, here, Albert just developing a knight. And at that point, I'm like, okay, he's not really wanting to take the center, uh, at least the very center of the board with a move like e5 right away. I'm just going to go right into a hippo again. So I play this move e3. So again, game two, a second hippo. We play bishop b2. By the way, guys, the hippo is basically when we fianchetto both of our bishops, we tuck our knights closely behind both of our centralized pawns. And at this point, okay, I mean, if black's not going to put immediate pressure on us, we can play a move like h3 and a3, covering squares such as g4 and b4. Very simple system. If you haven't checked out my uh, my playlist, the, my Hippopotamus uh, series playlist, make sure to check that out. Um, Hippopotamus defense, very underrated system, no matter what uh, level you're at. Um, you know, here, Albert just continues playing good normal chess, queen d7, right? Just continuing to develop his pieces, connecting these rooks on a8 and f8. I now, you know, I now have a big decision to make. I mean, black really isn't putting a ton of pressure on me. They're not, you know, charging down with, e, you know, e5, e4, f5, f4. It's now up to me. Okay, what do I do? Do I just play a move like castle and kingside? Or do I go with one of the four options um, for hippopotamus defense type counterplay? The reason I call it counterplay, even though we're playing as white, is we're not trying to win this game in 10 moves. We're just not trying to checkmate the king in 10 moves. That is not what the hippo defense or hippo attack is white is all about. I mean, in fact, it is move 10, and we have got our setup, right? Our Both of our knights right in the center of the board, tucked behind the centralized pawns and two fianchetto bishops. At this point, there are, again, four main ideas. One of them is to play in certain positions, moves like knight c3 or knight f3. We can always push a centralized pawn, a flank pawn to c4, or b4, or even move one of our b or g pawns. I end up playing this move of g4, a key idea to tuck this knight right behind, you know, attacking light squares such as h5 and f5, but especially the square of e4, preparing an e4 push. I think at this point I was looking at ideas like, okay, I played g4, knight g3, I'm not going to play knight, uh, I'm going to play queen e2, right? Develop that queen, play a move like e4, and keep this king in the center. I mean, that's one of my biggest pieces of advice for you hippo players. Sometimes you know where you want to castle. Sometimes you, you see your opponent's setup and you're like, okay, I'm just not going to castle queen side. I'm just not going to do it. So you castle king side. But there's positions like this where it's like, okay, maybe I'm not quite sure where I want to castle. So just keep the king in the center of the board. And at that point, um, your king's going to be on either c1 or g1 in a single move it's just very hard for the opponent to predict where to attack i mean if they attack on the queen side okay we'll castle king side if they attack on the king side we'll simply go over to the other side of the board so uh here's Zang, uh albert continuing with d4 expanding in the center and uh, i would say nine times out of ten in the hippo if if you have a chance maybe a little bit more actually maybe nine and a half times right um out of uh out of ten which is 19 out of 20 um close it up lock it down i mean in this case if we let black take on e3 our king's going to be pretty vulnerable to attack pretty loose especially with these pawns on h3 
and g4. And obviously, if we take on d4, I mean, black's just going to break this game open. Uh, so let's lock it up right away. Let's play this move of e4. Black now continuing to expand with b5. And I just continue to develop with queen e2. Notice, again, my king could be on c1 or on g1 at any given point, which makes it very hard for black. I mean, look, just think about it this way. If black here on the queen side of the board starts to just go crazy, right? I mean, if they just start to you know, sacrifice everything they have on this side of the board and they get a great attack. Okay, I'll just castle kingside and vice versa. Here we see the move of knight e8, bringing this knight back, you know, giving this bishop a little bit of breathing room as well, defending the square of e5. I was thinking that maybe black um, was looking to play a move like f5, um, but we now see this move after h4. I continue, you know, I'm, I'm here continuing to expand on the the king side, this move of knight d6, which really does two things. First off, it keeps an eye on f5, and it also um, eyes c4 ideas on the queen side. So I actually like this maneuver for black, knight e8 and knight d6. I continue now with bishop h3. Another key idea in the hippo, especially after g4 and knight g3 ideas, is to play h4 and then bishop h3. It looks very strange, but in this position, I'm eyeing ideas like g5 at any point simply attacking the queen on d7. So here, my opponent simply gets that queen the heck out of the way with queen c7. I'm not really threatening anything at the moment, but it's very uncomfortable to have a queen there. And why not just play queen c7 and i squares like a5 or b6? So we see this move now of queen queen over. I continue with knight f3, trying to get my pieces to the king side of the board. This may seem a little bit awkward, but I was actually somewhat comfortable in this position. We see the move knight e7 from black, and I now play rook g1. Guys, one of my old coaches, some of you guys may have heard of him, um, Eric Schiller, uh, one, of my, one of my old coaches back in the day when I was, um, you know, 10 to, probably about 10 to 14 years old. He told me that there are four rules in the opening, right? First off, put a pawn in the center, right? Put a pawn in the center. The second rule is to castle. Obviously, I haven't done that. In fact, in this game, I don't do it at all. Um, the third rule is to connect the rooks. And then the fourth rule, or the step really, is to point a rook at the opponent's king or queen. Guys, this move, rook g1, might seem very just uh, not useful, right? I mean, what, what am I doing? Well, guys, now all of a sudden I'm eyeing ideas like knight f5, right? If I play knight f5 now, black capture is back. I take with the g pawn and my rook is coming out of nowhere. So at this point, for the rest of this game, every single move, I'm looking at this move of knight f5 and trying to find the right time to strike. My opponent strikes here. My opponent strikes here with c4, right? Expanding on the queen side. Notice again, we do not want to take this pawn on c4. This is only going to break our position open even more. I simply continue by playing this move of h5, putting more pressure on g6, and actually eyeing h6 ideas, which is what I played. I think here my opponent probably should have taken the pawn on h6. That's what I was expecting. I was planning to play this move of knight takes e5, putting some pressure on d4. The but the computer actually really likes Bach here after moves like f6 and c3, right? Just kicking my pieces back. I think that bishop takes h6 is probably the way for black to go. That being said, again, this is a quick time control. And, um, you know, things could go south for back very quickly, at least the pawn structure wise with this pawn on d4 right in the center of the board. Um, but okay, I mean, after this move of h6, black decides not to take off the pawn, They're giving up the centralized pawn on e5, but instead playing this move of bishop h8. I mean, far from a blunder, black here still with a solid position, but now is white. I go, you know what? At the moment, there's nothing really, you know, crazy going on on the king side. I mean, uh, you know, a move like knight f5 here isn't crushing by any means. Um, you know, I, I end up actually just playing this move of a4, right? So putting some pressure on b5. Black has spent all this time expanding their pawns. Okay, let's start to put some pressure on b5. Notice, by the way, if a move like a6, we're simply going to take that pawn off. And if you take back, thank you for the rook. And this pawn cannot push up to b4 without us simply winning the pawn on c4 uh, straight off, right? So, okay, I mean, we see this move of queen a5 with check, and now I simply move the king over to f1, and okay, we start to trade off some pawns, and we now see this move of rook d8. Black here just trying to activate their position and defend their knight on d6. At this point, I'm going, you know what? My king is a little bit loose on f1, but more importantly, guys, this game uh, could easily break open on the queen side. I mean, black play moves like rook b8 or rook c8. I want my rooks to be connected, right? I want my rooks to be connected, and I want to have the ability to use both my rooks on the c and b-file. So I play this move of king g2, right? Just giving my rook on g1 some more options, uh, you know, to get more involved in this game. Here black responds with bishop d7, attacking the pawn on a4, and I simply respond with this move of bishop a3, right? Attacking the knight on d6, 
Um, notice black has to be careful here. If they play a move like knight b7 or knight e8, we simply say thank you for the knight on e7, right? So here my opponent, obviously not going to just hang a piece, very strong player. 2162 continues um, with this idea of queen a6, right? Just defending the knight. And in that case, okay, I play king h2. I actually wasn't worried about black taking off this pawn because they're simply going to lose material. I mean, if they take with the queen, okay, we just take the knight on d6. If they take with the bishop, um, at that case, I mean, let's just go through it, right? Bishop takes a4. Um, I'm going to take the knight on d6 now. And my idea here was that if the queen takes, um, again, thank you for the bishop. And if the rook captures back, I now have this idea of queen a2 forming a battery ram um, against the bishop. Uh, and, uh, you know, that will give me um, some counterattacking play. So that was my idea, at least, um, in the game. I think if you plug this into a computer program, it says that after the move of rook takes d6, um, you know, white here can just continue with a move like rook a3, right? Um, getting the rook in front of the queen. Um, so I think that's actually a little bit better probably than playing queen a2 straight off. But okay, I mean, rook a3, black here has some big issues to deal with on the queen side. I mean, we, we're looking at moves like rook, J, uh, rook g a1, um, putting a ton of pressure on that bishop. And once that bishop gets out of the way, putting a ton of pressure on a7. So um, quick little correction to my idea of queen a2. That's what I was planning. But it turns out that rook a3 is the better option according to the engine. And uh, I agree. I mean, I think that this gives us a very solid game. Uh, here, uh, you know, going back um, to the point after queen a6, in which case I played king h2. Um, again, I'm not worried about, you know, this pawn. We see black play the move of knight ec8. Um you know, uh, just hanging on to the knight, right? And almost kind of reinstating some ideas of potentially taking on a4. Even then, I really wasn't too worried about it. Um, I actually just continued with this move of uh, of knight f5, right? Just throwing my knight into the action. I finally got this move in, this move of rook g1 now paying off. Notice, by the way, I mean, black didn't take on f5 with the pawn, but if, if, if he did, if Albert decided to take this knight, my idea was g takes f5 with check, followed by knight g5, and white here is simply crushing. Sure, I'm down a piece for a pawn, but that being said, I mean, this king on f8 is in major, major trouble. We're looking at ideas like knight takes h7 with check against the king. If a move like uh, f6, we have knight e6 continuing to pursue the king. We're also looking at ideas like queen h5 threatening a mate in one. Notice this knight can't take the pawn. On f7 because it's currently pinned to the king on f8 so we i mean this knight on g5 is absolutely crushing this position we have a bishop on a3 very active directly pointed towards the king and queen h5 ideas in the air here black has a resignable position so my opponent after knight f5 albert very smart not to take the knight with the pawn but by simply playing knight takes f5 and here after g takes f5 we see the move of bishop f6 i continue with knight g5 right just trying to put as much pressure as i can on both f7 and h7 black here responds by taking off that knight right they're playing defense why not get rid of the attacking pieces and after rook takes g5 we see queen f6 now i remember at this point in the game i had about five minutes on the clock i had about five minutes my opponent albert zang had about uh 56 seconds so i definitely had the edge on time here I started to, you know, spend quite a bit of time. I, I very quickly played the move of rook a g1 because it just looked very natural and, you know, put a ton of pressure on g6 at the same time. Uh, after this move of king h8, however, I did take some time. I ended up playing queen g4. Uh, whole idea being if black wants to take on f5 now, we have rook g8 and this is going to be our uh, game over. I mean, we have a triple battery ram on the g file. This king cannot be exposed. Black responds by playing knight e7. But in this case, I simply drop my queen back to g3, putting some pressure on e5. And now we see the move of knight c6. And here I actually spent probably, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes on the clock, continuing to burn time. Uh, Albert here, you know, starting to catch up on the clock. I end up playing this move of f4. And really the reason I played it um, was because I noticed that my opponent, you know, at this point, probably less than 30 seconds, 30 seconds on the clock. Now, keep in mind, it is delayed 10 delay 10 seconds. So, I mean, the first 10 seconds of the clock don't count, right? And then the clock starts. But that being said, over the board chess, I mean, it's that's not a lot of time. It's just not. So I was trying to compl complicate things as much as I possibly could. For example, here, if he did take the pawn on, uh, you know, f4, okay, I just take back with the queen. If he plays uh, g takes f5, I have this idea of queen h4, and white here is simply crushing. Whole idea being that we're threatening to play rook g8 with check and simply win the queen on f6. And here, if black tries to get that queen out of the way with playing a move like uh, queen e6, for example, notice, you know, queen e7, queen d6 don't work because of our very active bishop 
on a3. We can now just play a move like bishop takes f5, and I mean, okay, I mean, this position is just resignable for black. So following the move of f4, Albert decides not to take the pawn on f4 or the pawn on f5, but instead continues with rook e8. But this actually allows me to play f takes g6. Whole idea being, look, if you want to take the pawn back, Thank you for the bishop, and on top of that, I'm just going to start taking off your pieces like they're candy. And if you take this bishop on h3, which is what happened in the game, we simply take on f7, attacking the rook on e8. I mean, again, I mean, black here just has to take the pawn. They really have no choice. I mean, if black tries to save their bishop, you know, I mean, I could just take the rook right off. But even better than that is just playing rook g8 with check. Whole idea being that I have a mate in just a few moves. So, okay, I mean, g takes f7 is played, attacking the rook. Um... This rook can't run. Uh, black just has to take this thing off. So, okay, we see queen takes f7. At this point, uh, I'm starting to run really low on the clock. I mean, I got less than a minute um, left, and I still feel very comfortable here. Um, I'm not, at this point in the game, I'm not sensing that black has a ton of crazy counterplay. But I, I did miss an option here, and that is this move of, F, uh, of f5. I mean, f5 would have been very strong. The whole idea there is that, okay, I mean, we take the bishop next, and we're not going to lose a pawn, and if black does try to take the pawn f5, we have rook takes f5, and a ton of attacking chances against this king, uh, you know, on h8, which can't even move at the moment. Um, of course, instead of f5, I ended up playing king takes h3. Not a, not, a, not a bad move at all, but I think f5 was definitely better. Um, just looking to trap the bishop, and then if you take on f5 okay we get a very active rook out of it in this case okay i mean we take with the king all of a sudden black's able to play this move of queen takes f4 i actually end up deciding to trade down here i was looking at checkmate ideas but i just couldn't find anything i mean if you play rook g8 i, I don't have queen g7 because of the rook defends that square so i end up just taking the queen off the board and after e takes f4 playing bishop d6 guys at this point i mean we are both very low on the clock in fact i i stopped um you know, I really stopped uh, recording around this around this point. Uh, notice that it's very hard for Black to uh, move this knight, right? I mean, even if Black plays a move like knight d8, all of a sudden we see how strong this bishop on d6 is. In fact, right now we could just play bishop e5 because that square is no longer defended, distract the rook, and then play this move of rook g8. We have ourselves a game over. So guys, I mean, this knight, um, you know, going back to bishop d6, this knight can't move. I mean, there's just no way around it. Um, yeah, this king's in major trouble. I want to get this move of bishop e5 in, but I can't at the moment because black doesn't just have the rook defending it, um, but the knight as well. So we see this move instead of rook e6 attacking both my bishop and the pawn at h6. At this point, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take off this pawn at 4 play move like king g3. Rook g6 is played, I play king f3. Uh, you know, the rest of this game I had to try to remember um, from, from memory. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got it down to the T though. Uh, here black, you know, Albert continuing with rook g8. I decided to take this rook off the board. I was actually completely okay if he took back with the rook because at this point, okay, I take back, I play e5 and I have king e4, king d5 options in the air and I'm going to have two connected pass pawns right in the center of the board and a very active king. I mean, really eventually chasing down this pawn on a7, giving this pawn a4 touchdown. So I was very comfortable here. Uh, here, uh, Zhang decides not to take with the rook, but instead by playing this move of h6, g6, trying to keep some pieces on the board. I respond by playing e5 anyways. King g7 is played, rook c1 attacking this knight. If this knight runs, I have rook c7 with check winning a pawn. So here he tries to hang on with rook c8. But I now play this move of king e4, rook h1. I, you know, a move like rook h1, I don't think that this is like, you know, a crushing, you know, a crushing move or anything. But at this point, guys, we both have 15 seconds on the clock. And again, it's delay 10. So you have 10 seconds to think um before the clock starts but even then you just gotta you just gotta place all moves at that point place all moves i was very nervous at this point um you know i really wanted this win he plays king e6 and i respond by playing rook h7 you know just putting some pressure on a7 and trying to you know make something happen here he continues with knight e7 and in that case i'm like okay i'll just take the pawn off on d4 we see rook d8 check and king e4 i was actually expecting this move of knight f5 right um, looking at rook d4 check ideas, making my king run away. Even then, I think that I'm slightly better. Um, but I think that, you know, knight f5 is really the move here that would save black. However, we see this move of a6. And again, um, you know, Zhang and I both, I mean, we're just we're just way down on the clock. Uh, you know, and at this point, after a6, I found this tactic of playing rook takes e7 with check and then bishop g5. And it's at this point, I can't quite remember where the king went. I can't remember if it went to e8 or d7, but it, it doesn't really matter in either case. I just take the rook off. And then at this point, I couldn't remember where this king, 
moved, but you know, I, I did just march my pawn up to d5 at that point. When I have my pawn on d5, I'm wiping out half of the sixth rank, and I can just march my king over to g5, and um, this king just can't hang on to everything. So at this point, um, Elber Zang uh, resigned the game, and I ended up taking this one home with a hippopotamus defense. So at this time, at this point in the tournament, guys, I have played um, uh, two players higher than me, right? A 23-33, um, or sorry, a 23-34, uh, as well as a 21-62, and I'm one out of two. So I'm like, okay, I'm starting to gain some points. Um, again, my ultimate goal is to hit 2,200, um, you know, hitting National Master. So this is a big one for me. And, uh, you know, I was very happy to come out with it, even though, you know, at the moment it was very stressful. I mean, we're talking 15 seconds apiece, just trying to trying to make it happen, right? So, um, but anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed that game, uh, going over some of, my, uh, some of my moves, some of his moves. Um, I think both of us played good moves. Both of us made mistakes as well. Um, but hopefully you guys got some hippopotamus ideas out of it and just some ideas in general, right? So, um, yeah, make sure to tune in tomorrow to check out game three of the tournament. Uh, in which case I go up against, uh, 2129 Joshua Harrison with the black pieces.